Here we have a few of the different topics that we're going to cover today. Um, some of these are frequently asked questions that we have through the office. Some of them have been submitted to you, uh, by you, sorry. Perfect. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to run through topics one to three, uh, and then we're going to stop for some question time. So anything that comes to mind, just write it down or pop it in the chat box um, so we can address it then. Um, and we'll just jump straight into it, I think. Uh, so topic one, we have how to minimise payment delays when working with plan managers and the top ways to ensure fast payment of your invoices. Uh, so I will pass over to you guys, uh, Mark and Aidan, to answer that one. Easy. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, so you, when you guys um, sort of grabbed your tickets and everything, there was like a little option to add any sort of extra questions or anything you had um, relating to the topic. So what we've done is we've, we've consolidated them to sort of answer them the best we can in sort of the group. So one of them that we got was like if there's a specific format um, that a plan manager would like to see invoices in, um, sort of what needs to be included on the invoice to ensure sort of like fast payment, no delays and stuff like that. So there are minimum NDA requirements on invoices that we need to abide by. So you know, we need to make sure that there's the client details both first and their last name, um, the NDIS number as well, if it's applicable. We do understand though that like some providers don't actually have access to that NDIS number. It is like a confidentiality thing as well. So as long as like the first and surname are on there quite clearly, we can see who it's for, then it's all good. Um, we, you also need like a unique invoice number so that you know there's no potential delay at um, duplications or anything like that um, we need to make sure that there's a date on the actual invoice and then dates of the services as well um, a description of the services you know whether, whether it's in detail or if you've got the supporting line items on there then we can go by that um, and then just making sure that you're including like the quantity of the services the service totals um, the invoice total itself and then you guys as providers, we need to make sure we've got like your ABN number and your banking details so we can make sure we're actually paying sort of like the right people. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, it's it's handy to have the supporting line items on the invoices if you do know them. Um, otherwise, a really good description is fine. Sort of the NDA don't care too much if the plan manager doesn't have the, in, the line items on the invoices. It's just if you're speaking directly with the NDA, they would like them, but otherwise, usually we're okay. Um, in terms of like the preferred format, we do prefer to have a PDF document sent through. It's like, you know, the PDFs is like the easiest one to deal with, but we do accept like Word documents or Excel spreadsheets because we can convert them all to PDF ourselves. Um, given that like the above requirements are on the invoice and like it can be submitted in any form really, um, except for like the dot pages because we at NDSP, we run on like a window system and that's Apple, which it's just, we've tried and it just, it doesn't work, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, we do accept like handwritten invoices, given that it's all like legible and we can, you know, clearly see what the services was, how much it costs, who it's for, who it was from. Um, you know, we just need to make sure that we can confidently be processing it correctly. Um, we do also have like a template on our website under like the provider toolbox. So if you, you know, ever were like, oh, you know, like I need something to base my invoices off, you know, we've got that available on the website and we are more than happy to send it through to you. Um, and then one of the questions that we got was, um, sort of if we want the invoices addressed to the client or if we want them addressed to sort of like um, us as the plan manager, um, it is sort of required that it is addressed specifically to the client because the client is the one that is receiving the services. Um, the plan manager's information doesn't actually need to be on the invoice itself. Um, the only sort of like, I suppose, you know, change in that is that if the client is under 18 years of age, then sort of the parent or the plan nominee can be addressed on the invoice and like have it, you know, sent to them. However, the client's information just needs to be really, really clear that they're the one that received the services, um, especially in like the odd case when like both the parent and the um, sort of the parent and the, uh, the child are both participants of NDSP. Um, and then one thing that we sort of try and kick in a lot is with providers, we just want to make sure that you guys are also having conversations with your participants about what budgets that plan are plan managed that we manage. Um, you know, we don't want to be, I mean, it happens, but sometimes we, you know, receive invoices that, you know, are for services for a budget that we don't plan manage. So we, you know, try and we don't want to have any more delays by saying, having to send it back saying, hey, unfortunately, we don't actually mention. Yeah, but I can't hear Is that a meeting that you're in? 
Um, sorry, and just Stacey just um, just popped a quick question in saying that the NDIS number is um, confidential. Um, for some participants, they just don't want to share that NDIS number. It isn't a requirement on the invoices. So, um, you know, in, like, in my history, for example, like, I've had participants who don't want their providers to know their NDIS number, um, which is completely up to them. So as long as, yeah, the, the first and surname are on there, then um, we're, all, we're all good to go. Um, and then... We also received just some questions about like the stand around, uh, the standard turnaround times for invoices. So I'll pass it over to Aiden, um, and he will kick into them for you. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's good to see some faces today. So again, one of the questions we got, like Mark explained, is what are the general turnaround times here at NDSP um, when it comes to submitting a payment um, for the invoice you're submitting? So our business terms are three to five business days um, for us to release payment. The time frame from leaving us and reaching your bank is completely out of our control and that can just differ. Um, and this is again assuming that there's been no issues with either the invoice itself or the client. Um, so some issues we might have, um, maybe we're having um, some problems with maybe claiming over the maximum rate, uh, incorrect line items being used or on a client side, maybe, uh, you know, we might be talking insufficient funding or maybe a budget isn't available. So those types of issues can extend uh, the time that it takes for that payment to make it to you if the payment's going to be made um, at all. Uh, so our recommendation to our providers is that if you're not receiving payment on day four or five, business day four or five, um, just give us a call. Uh, we do have a team that can walk you through any issues we might be having. Um, you know, that issue can, again, either be resolved on the phone at that moment, um, or we can give you a notification of sort of how things are going and give you an update on that particular invoice. Um, and just keep in mind that when I say three to five business days, I mean business days. So we're not including weekends or public holidays. So just keep that in mind when you're um, when you're submitting your invoices. Okay. You muted, Bonnie. Yeah, just on you, Bonnie. <laughs> you muted. <laughs> Be a mark against my name <laughs> in our team meeting. Um, thanks so much, guys. It's some great information. Um, and to everybody online, if you didn't get a chance to write that down and take photos, don't stress. We're going to send all of this information out to you afterwards. Um, if you do have any questions, keep popping them in the chat box as we go along or just write them down. Um, but we will just move straight on into our second topic, which is why can't plan managers provide the reason of the non approval of an invoice? And pass back to you guys. Easy. Thanks, Bonnie. So unfortunately, it is like a big thing around sort of confidentiality as to why we're not always available or able to provide like the full picture. Um, as a plan manager, it's a sort of our responsibility to protect like the client and their details. So any sort of client information around sort of like budgets to a provider, like without authorization or permission from a participant or an authorised nominee, we're just sort of not able to give that information. Um, if the full picture is required, like if you do need to know this information, you know, accurately be able to provide this. Um, we do recommend that you guys sort of get in contact with the participant or the nominee and see if you guys can have that chat like behind closed doors. Um, otherwise, you know, have the, um, you know, the participant or their nominee advise us that you know, they've given permission that we can talk to you guys and sort of we can let you know sort of like the bigger picture. But we do sort of recommend having those conversations with them just, you know, so we can make sure. Um, and then around non-approvals, um, if if a participant has advised NDSP that they don't approve an invoice, so, um, you know, some participants want us to send their invoices to them when we receive them just so they can have a look over them and approve it. Um, if they do come back to us and state that they don't approve it, we do ask them and sort of have a chat with them if they're happy for us to disclose um, that information with um, the provider or if sort of the participant wants to have that discussion with the provider themselves. Um, because if we can fix it, sort of if we can have a chance like, hey, yep, you know, that's like this date was incorrect. Like if we can have a chat with them and get them to fix it, then sort of that's okay. Um, but again, like sometimes the participant just wants to make sure it's handled themselves so they're completely aware. Um, so yeah, it is all sort of just up to the confidentiality of the participant and, and who we need to, um, whose details we need to protect. Um, but yes, so yeah, essentially just it's confidentiality. We do recommend just having the conversations with, with your participants so yeah, you're all on the same page. Perfect, thanks guys. 
Um, and again, just jot down any questions in the chat box there or just write them down to bring up um, at the question time, which we'll have at the end of this topic here. Um, so we'll just move straight on into it. Uh, so the next topic is what happens if a participant requests a refund from a provider where we, uh, NDSP, are plan managing the budget? Back to you guys. Yeah, so thanks, Bonnie. When NDSP are notified of, usually by the participant, that a refund needs to occur, um, there's a few steps that we take. So the first thing is that we do investigate why uh, the refund is being requested um, and, you know, obviously keep details of, of, of that reason. Um, and then we do send out a formal request to the provider, uh, basically requesting those funds back, keeping everything very, very clear. But a key point when it comes to refunds is to keep in mind that as a plan manager, we are only really here in a financial intermediary capacity. We can't facilitate disputes when it comes to things like refunds. So essentially, if the refund's not going to be cleared, we do recommend that the participant and the provider have that discussion um, around that dispute and that refund. And if there can't be a conclusion and there's no decision made, uh, then our recommendation further is to take that to the NDI directly because they can act as a medium essentially for that dispute and make a formal decision uh, and notify us appropriately as to whether to pay or not to pay that invoice. Okay, so that's our sort of process behind a, a formal refund request. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, so we do have some questions coming through. Um, continue to pop them in the chat box um, and the guys will be happy to answer them or just yeah, write them down. So, oh, my computer's glitching. Stacey has put in a random question for another time. Emergency funding, how, or when and how does that get funded or paid? So it's going to depend what type of emergency funding. So if we're talking for things like core supports or even assistive technology that's been put in place, it's going to heavily depend on how the NDI are actually managing that. The NDI will be recognising the need. They will be actually implementing a solution. So it's hard to say, uh, but essentially once we notify that the funds are available, we can, my understanding is we would be able to make a claim immediately, but it's going to very much depend on how the NDI themselves actually action that emergency request. Stacey has just clarified that it's COVID funding. Um, it was emergency okay. care for COVID due to the parent not being able to care for them. Um, yeah. yeah. So again, it's just going to be how the NDI actually handle that themselves. We can't create funding. We only manage funding that is available. So if extra funding is needed, uh, the NDI would be handling that request, that change of circumstances. And essentially, once the funding is available, we can make payments for those extra supports. But yeah, that would be something I would be following up with the NDI directly about and just ensuring that we get that notification once the funds are made available. Perfect. Thanks, guys. I'll go back up here to Billie Jean. Um, so the format that we send out monthly statement, uh, yeah, send monthly statements. I understand that clients have access to NAPA, but some of my clients do not have access to computers, et cetera. Um, and I think I can probably help with that, Billie Jean. If you do have clients that are with NDSP that don't have computer access and wish to receive monthly statements, um, contact me after this session and I'll be able to get them posted out every month. Um, so that's something that we're more than happy to facilitate that people for people that don't have computers or phones to access. So, um, yeah, send me through some names and we'll get them posted every month. Um, and we've got Rafael. So on which case does an invoice get partially paid? That's going to be touched on in the next topic, isn't it? Yeah, so we'll, we'll just leave that one for a moment. But if you have any further questions after we chat about it, let us know. Um, we've got another one here. Do you, do you get the invoices approved by the participants or support coordinator before payment? Um, yes. So before, like in like a general sense, if we do receive an invoice and it has like all the information on it, we are usually good to go to process unless the participant has asked or the support coordinator has asked to approve them beforehand. So if they do have that sort of um, that stock in place or we have like a note on file for them to state that they want to approve them, we will either make phone contact or email contact, whichever their preference is, before any payment is made. So if they've got that in place, we can't make payment until we get an approval from them. Yeah. Perfect. It's a choice. So off, um, 
When a client signs up with us, general practice, we just process invoices as soon as we receive them, unless we're asked to have them approved. So we only put in the approval system if it's requested. Um, yeah. Well, that's all of the questions for now. I can't see anyone typing. Oh, you're right. Do you have a question, Sally? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, there's no one typing, so we'll just move on into the next one. Um, so we'll go into what we have down as topic four. Um, so what are our risk management uh, processes to support our providers? What happens when there is an overspend? Back to you guys. Cool. So um, one of the risk management process to support providers in this instance is um, all of the invoices that we do get, we only process um, if they are up to those, the NDA standards, which is like the requirements that I mentioned just above. Um, it, we don't process anything if there's any like conflicting information. So if a supporting line item or like the description of support is different, we won't process. We will be making contact to make sure, um, you know, what the actual support was, if we can process it correctly. Um, nine times out of 10, the invoice would need to be amended to show sort of that, that correct service. Um, if sort of like there's client discrepancy information on there, for example, like if the client's first and last name is on the invoice, but the NGRS number is for someone different, we would need to clarify who it's for. So, you know, unless all oh, like the invoice is completely up to the standard, we won't process. Um, what this sort of does is not without processing any sort of incorrect invoices, it protects sort of all parties involved, but okay, like us as the plan manager, the participant and yourselves as the providers. Um, it sort of protects all from like the risk of audit by the NDIA. It's like if we're processing invoices, for example, that are like over the rate or anything like that, you know, we can all get in trouble essentially for processing them wrong. Um, and the NDIA have set up the arrangements, you know, in mind, like for the sole purpose of having a maximum rate to go against. Um, and like when we say like at risk by audit by the NDIA, people sort of sometimes think, oh, well, you know, it doesn't happen to everybody. You know, like uh, it's like a one in one in a thousand or something like that that someone gets audited. But when a participant's plan does end, um, the NDA look into the services they received, um, and essentially is just like a mini audit for that plan. So you know, if they go through it and they see that we've been processing things over the rate, or you know, they're receiving incorrect services or anything like that, you know, that is a huge red flag. So by being really cautious about what we process, it sort of protects all parties involved. Um, what we also have is, it's just sort of like, we call it our 10K approval system. So invoices that are over $10,000, um, they actually go to like a, a really, it's like a small specific team that just ensure that if those services can, like are duplicated, that plan is going to, you know, it's going to sustain that, you know, that amount of money coming out. So for example, if we received an invoice with, you know, for $10,000 and it had a month of services, if, for example, that $10,000 was going to happen for the next month and the month after, is the plan going to sustain that till the end? And oftentimes, unfortunately, it doesn't. So that just triggers a budget alert where we would then be getting in contact with the participant, the support coordinator, anyone, you know, one of the nominees to say, hey, look, are these services going to be continuing like this? You know, we've done the maths on it essentially and it's not going to last. And this is often where, you know, we'll be, um, you know, suggesting maybe a review is, is best and it's best to get in as early as possible. And then one other thing that we have is our NAPA portal, which is available for sort of participants, um, authorised nominees alike. And it's essentially just real-time viewing of all of the plan managed funding. So it isn't agency or self-managed funding. It's purely just what we have as the plan manager. Um, essentially, it is, it's like, like I said, it's real-time viewing of a participant's spending. So you know, it, we've got it laid out of each budget, how much they had initially, what's remaining, how much is being spent. And it's sort of got like that same day update of invoices. So if you're processing an invoice, for example, this morning, it would be showing up on a participant snapper, you know, by this afternoon. So they can see when the invoices come through. So it's just like really sort of up there with the, with the real-time viewing. 
Um, and then one other thing that we do is we always recommend service agreements, which I'm going to pass it over to Aidan and he's just going to touch on the service agreements a bit more with you. Yeah, so we always recommend to service providers to be submitting their service agreements to us if there is a schedule of supports in place. So if you've got a total cost of supports that you're quoting um, that's going to be provided usually over the plan period for the participant, absolutely send it to us because another function that NAPA has, which is fantastic, is we can actually allocate service agreements against providers uh, on particular participants for that total cost. So it does a couple of things. Uh, it allows us to ensure that that particular provider isn't going to overspend their initial agreement. Um, and we can obviously increase that as more agreements come through. Uh, and it also ensures that those funds are safe um, for that provider. So it's a really good budgeting tool as well. Um, so if you have multiple agreements for all the supports that that participant's gonna be accessing, you can ensure that those funds are safe for that particular, uh, for that particular participant. Um, and those providers as well. So they're not going to overspend. So it's just a handy budget tool. Um, and that brings me into another question that we got through was around what measures we might have in place to reduce the chance um, of clients overspending and our duties sort of, uh, you know, regarding low budgets. So uh, besides the service agreement uh, allocation system that we have in place, we do have a client engagement team here that work out of Adelaide. Uh, and essentially their role is to check in multiple times a year uh, with our participants you know, and all their support networks um, to not only just have a chat, but to pass on a bit more information around the actual utilization of their plan and how it's going. Um, and throughout these check-ins as well, we are again, uh, requesting any service agreements that might be in place so that we can put them on that file um, to again, further ensure that that overspend isn't gonna happen um, if possible. Um, in these conversations, they are having pretty deep conversations in regards to the utilization of the plan so for example if a participant is uh, we've recognized that they are overspending or underspending that is brought up and discussed and we offer any support we can in regards to um, you know it could be even helping find further supports um, you know giving a better understanding of how the funding can be utilized what supports can can't be accessed bits and bobs like that um, and some other supports that we actually do have in place is again, we have NAPA, which is accessible at any time. It is live and up to date and gives you complete transparency around the spending so far. Um, and it was mentioned before, we do send out our monthly statements. And as Bonnie mentioned before, we can send them out by post as well, which is really, really handy. Um, and that gives a complete overview of the spending that's happened over the last month um, and, and basically says how much funding is remaining. Um, Another question we had come through was, are service providers able to gain consent uh, from the participant or the plan nominee uh, to basically have conversations with us to determine if there is sufficient funding for their supports um, and if they can get information around the funding that is within the plan? And the answer to that is when it comes to if you've got a quote of support, so if you're a service provider, you're going to be providing a certain amount, and you need to understand if there is sufficient funding in the plan, we can confirm that without further consent. We can confirm that there is sufficient funding for your supports. Without a service agreement, we can't allocate that funding. So that would only be a confirmation at that time. That might change in the future. So again, recommending that you do send through your service agreements. Um, if you're requiring further information, so maybe there is insufficient funding and you need to know how much there is so that you can fit your supports in, that is when we do need consent from the participant or the nominee. Remaining funding within a plan is very sensitive information. So as long as the participant or the nominee or the appropriate nominee are okay, essentially with us passing that information on and we go through that forum, um, there's absolutely no issue with us passing that information on to you because we are part of that support network and we're here to help. Um, and another little question we had come through was, do we actually get any notification if there's any change in the funding? And the answer is no. If the, even if there's a new plan that comes through early, we don't receive any notification. If funding decreases or increases, we don't receive any notification. We either stumble across it um, or we're notified by a third party, like a support coordinator, service provider. Um, very, very, very rarely are we actually contacted directly um, to let us know that something's happened. Um, so yeah, so that answers that question. Um, and we did get another one through. No, I think it's one too many. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Sorry. We, no, sorry. So <laughs> we got a, one of the questions was um, sort of what happens if a participant's sort of budget runs out, but you know, you guys have already provided the service. So what do we do? 
Um, and then one of the other sort of like sub questions is like, when can we as the plan manager advise you that the funding is either sort of run low or run out completely? So I'll start with the last bit. So unfortunately, again, due to confidentiality, uh, we as the plan manager, we're not able to advise you if the plan, if the funding is running low in the, in like the budget that you provide services in. Um, it would only be until essentially we receive an invoice and there's not enough funding to make full payment of it. Um, so it was sort of like touched on slightly earlier with like when it's like a partial payment available to be made. In, this is like the instance where that is. So we could advise you sort of like, unfortunately there is only X amount of funding remaining and we can make a partial payment of that amount to your invoice, but we will need that invoice essentially amended to show the amount that we can pay. Um, it is again, yeah, confidentiality, unless the participant has advised us prior that we can advise you as the provider how much funding is available that we can, you know, have a chat about. Um, we, yeah, unfortunately, we're only able to let you know when it has been depleted. Um, when it has been depleted and um, there is sort of a, a, a wing within the NDIS that uh, called like the provider payments team, um, if a participant's plan is current, what we advise is that if planning, if the funding has run out, we would then advise, you know, to be going for a plan review, um, you know, because clearly, you know, there's not enough funding to pay for the services and there are still services ongoing, especially if there's still a bit of time before the plan ends. Um, but if a participant's plan has expired and you've got sort of outstanding invoices, we as the plan manager can submit the invoices to the NDA for a payment consideration. So what this is, is, we as the plan manager will get as much information as we can from you guys as the providers, support coordinators from the participants as well, you know, to get any evidence or any supporting documentation as to why there was an overspend sort of with the account um, or if there was any change of circumstances or anything like this. Um, and then we make that submission with the invoices that are outstanding to the NDIS um, in, I suppose, the hopes that they can make that payment. Um, there is unfortunately a little bit of a delay with the NDIS, as I'm sure we all know the NDIS can be a little bit um, a little bit slow at times. Um, we sort of give a recommendation of between like four to six weeks before we even receive a response, sort of as the plan manager. Um, we when we make the submission, we receive like a submission ID. We are you know more than happy to give that to you guys as the provider. Um, if you know the support the support coordinator or the nominee or the participant would be advised of that ID. Um, and we can follow it up sort of whenever we feel necessary. We set a task for about a month after submission to check on it. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we rarely see a response from the NDIS, you know, for four to six weeks. And sometimes they're just asking for more information. Um, sometimes they're just stating like, unfortunately, it hasn't been done. Or, you know, on the, the most positive is that we get is, yep, no worries, we can make that payment. And then they would just send us the funding and then we would get in contact with you guys to say, hey, look, the NDIS have said yes, which is obviously best case scenario, they're paying it. Um, and then we would, yeah, make that payment to you guys. Perfect. And I think another important thing to mention there is that if the budget was plan managed, it's the plan manager that has to do that submission for you. Um, you as the provider do not do that separately. If it was a plan managed budget, the plan manager needs to do that for you. Um, there have been a few things pop up here in the chat box. So I'll go back just because the next topic we have is transport, which is quite lengthy. So I'll just do these now. Yeah. Um, so Stacey's asked, what if the cause is unavailable and the psychosocial recovery coach or peer mentor is the only person available? Can they be paid in lieu of? So I don't know if you guys want to touch on this or maybe follow it up. I think that's probably something we can follow up externally because I think that might be a little bit specific. Yeah. Uh, and there's probably a few questions we'd need to answer to be able to answer that question. Yeah. So I reckon we're more than happy to chase that up afterwards. Perfect. Um, we'll follow that up for you, Stacey. But she has asked another question as well. So we've yeah. got, um, I had a participant who was agency managed, but they wanted to use a non-registered provider. How is that funding allocated? Yeah. 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 So... Bottom line is if a, if a budget is agency managed, it needs to be claimed by agency registered providers because uh, there is a process, as some of you might know, you need to make that booking, you need to claim through the portal. Non-registered providers just simply cannot do that. Um, so then it would be just a matter of requesting for that budget to be made plan managed, self-managed, whatever, and that would then be up to the NDIA. But yeah, essentially a non-registered 
provider cannot claim through an agency managed budget. There's no flexibility there. We can we can recommend that that provider um, you know potentially go and become registered. Yeah. Um, but that is again that's only like advice we can give. That would be something that the provider would need to follow up on. Yeah, and um, that's a lengthy process and it's quite costly as well. Yeah. So yeah. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, and Rufel has asked some questions, which have all been answered. Um, and then we have another one here from Sanjay. So in the case of overspend, could a provider recover the balance from the participant or lose money? So, yeah, it is. It's, it's a little bit of like a, a tricky situation because, you know, the participants, you know, they have received the services. Um, we can make more than one submission to the NDIS. So if we do receive like a, if we do receive a rejection or, um, you know, asking for information, we can make another submission in the hopes that the NDIS will make payment. Um, if, you know, we've submitted a few times and they're just saying, no, um, you know, the budget was exhausted, they shouldn't have received the services or, you know, the other reasons that the NDIS give, um, it, it, it's a little bit tricky because we do recommend sort of the participant and the provider and like together, um, you know, potentially going and speaking with like their local member of parliament or like their MP, um, just to see if there's anything that they can do to assist. Once this sort of happens, it is completely outside of our sort of range of what we can do. We can assist with like the supporting documentation that we received prior. Um, but um, all we can really do is recommend, yes, yeah, speaking maybe with someone from like the state MP. Um, I know like worst case scenario, like the, you know, the last option is like, in, like through the AAT. Um, but yeah, again, that would be up to the par the provider and the participant to have that you know conversation obviously if it's like quite a large sum of money sort of like essentially everyone is out of pocket with it um but yeah so I, I hope that answers it if you've got something a little bit more specific Sanjay we're more than happy to have a chat with you afterwards if you've got something that's sort of like currently ongoing perfect thanks guys um and I guess we'll just jump straight into it um Stacey's next question was in regards to transport and it can be claimed in three different yeah, ways well. and yes we know <laughs> so I think it's probably one one of the topics that we receive the most um queries about definitely which is yeah transport so these guys are going to jump into don't be sorry Stacey oh, you're going to love this next we, bit <laughs> yeah it's um it's a big topic so you guys can just jump straight into it easy all right yeah so um yeah, transport, as yeah, Bonnie just said, is like one of our most common, I suppose, like queries that we get through um, our like queries team because it's like so easily done incorrectly. If there's just like a lot of general understanding. And to everyone's credit, we're just like trying to understand how it's set out because the NDIS did not make it incredibly clear sort of when they explain transport and the arrangements and the guide. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down essentially just like what the O2 transport budget would be. Um, so like just like a brief description of that and then how to sort of claim for transport, whether you're traveling through time, if you're going back kilometers or anything like that. Um, and just like a few sort of helpful hints and tips that we've got as well. So the O2 budget that I'm going to start off with um, the sort of definition of the O2 transport budget is it allows a participant to pay a provider to transport them to an activity that is not itself a support. So what this does is it assists the participant in obtaining support that is outside of their home that they want to make the trans like the transport to. Um, we most commonly get these as like invoices or receipts through like taxis and Ubers because those are the ones that sort of would come out of this budget. Um, in a participant's plan, the O2 budget is laid out in like, usually it's like only two ways. Um, often it is written as a fortnightly instalment that is paid into the participant's nominated bank account. So this is always going to be managed by the agency. We, there was like a short period of time where they wrote it incorrectly and plans as plan managed. The NDIS realized that that was a big boo-boo um, and essentially told us as a plan manager, if you see this, speak with a the participant, they need to get it sort of organised with the NDIA. Um, so what this does is that the NDIA would be giving the participant um, a set amount of funding that they would receive sort of either each fortnight into their nominated bank account, which is to cover their transport sort of requirements. Um, it is unfortunately quite commonly known that it is often not enough for the participant. So there's often a lot of reviews that we recommend for participants if they do run out of that funding. 
Um, and then the other way it's written um, in interplans as plan managed is flexible true core. So what this means is that we can move funding through like the, the four core budgets, essentially just to accommodate the participants' transport needs. Okay, so that is the one that sort of we sort of like would, we like to see that one because it means we can help the most. Um, we, with the O2 transport, we, we probably get that written in like written on invoices the most because if you just search up the arrangements and search up transport that's like the first thing that you see for transport and you know if you're doing transport or travel in your invoicing and your services that makes sense to use that budget um it's just yeah unfortunately there are well fortunately i suppose there are other ways of claiming transport because this one is more specific to just just the client themselves um so I'll start off with just discussing the provider travel, which is the labour cost, which is how you claim for time. So when um, you're billing for time travel to or from services, um, that transport is actually billed using the same support code of the service that you're providing. So, you know, if you're providing sort of social supports with the participant and you're also travelling with them um, and you want to claim for your time, uh, you would use the same code that you used your actual services on. Um, again, if you don't know the support line items, you're more than happy to call NDSP and we can sort of assist you and pick up, like, you know, discuss with you which one the right one might fit. Um, otherwise, a really detailed description will be fine and then we will just make that conscious decision. Um, when claiming through time, a provider can claim up to 30 minutes of time if they're travelling in, like, the modified monitor model, like, one to three for your areas. Um, or 60 minutes if you're in four or five. Um, one thing that we made sure that we were going to touch on quite heavily is for remote or very remote participants um, and the travel. So when it's a remote or very remote, the cost can be discussed with the participant, um, granted that it doesn't go above the hourly rate set by the NDIA. So if you're claiming the time transport against the um, sort of the same light item as the service, it obviously can't go above that rate. Um, so it's the same thing for remote or very remote. It's more so the amount of time that it takes to make that travel. That's, you know, the discussion we'd be recommending you guys have because, because the rate can be agreed upon. If you're traveling for seven hours, for example, like seven hours is a lot of time. You know, the conversations might be able to be had where you guys can agree on just like a set amount of, you know, three hours or something like that because there's, the amount that you're claiming is still quite high. Um, and we just we just really want to make sure that, you know, we're not depleting participants sort of funding just through sort of transport. Um, and with the provider travel labour costs through time, it needs to be made on its own separate line to the primary support. So again, if you're doing social supports and you've, you know, been out in the community for three hours, for example, and you're claiming 30 minutes of travel, that 30 minutes needs to be on its own separate line. So we can differentiate what was the service and what was the actual travel time. Um, what I will kick into the the non-labour or activity-based transport now, which um, I, I do apologise in advance. If you thought that was a lot of talking, this one will be a lot more. Um, non-labour transport and activity-based transport, they're claimed um, by Kilometre and they're honestly quite similar um, in the way that they're claimed. Um, non-labour provider travel is sort of the, the travel that the provider is doing either to or from the participant or the services um, when the participant is not travelling with them or is not travelling with the support worker, whereas activity-based transport is almost the same except the participant is travelling with the, the support worker or the provider. So, that yeah, the only difference really between them is one is with the participant and one is not. Um, Non-labour also, though, it includes like road tolls and parking fees, so they can be included on invoice. So, sticking with the social example, if, you know, you've traveled out to, you know, a park or a zoo or something like that, for example, and um, you've had to pay like a $10 parking ticket or anything like that, that can be written on the invoice just as a parking fee and that $10, and then it would be using that the same line item um, for the actual travel itself. Um, and then, yeah, we would just process it out of there. So it can only come from that non-labor, however. Um, with kilometres travelled, there's no actual like maximum or minimum amount of kilometres that a provider can travel or like charge for a participant, you know, given that is like the reasonable amount of distance between the locations travelled. So often on these invoices, we can like see on the invoice sort of the, the pickup location or like this, like location A to location B, 
Um, and if we do things that are like that, it's actually quite a lot of kilometres. We can essentially Google Maps it and see how like long the distance is. And if it is, you know, overly excessive, we want to be having that conversation just in case, you know, the week's worth of transport was put on one day. That would, you know, make more sense. Um, but yeah, there's no, the NDRS haven't got like a maximum or minimum as long as it is the kilometres that you're travelling, basically. Um, so unlike the labour cost of the travel where it's claimed against the same line item as the service, um, provider travel, non-labour and activity based, they have their own sort of line items in the arrangements. Um, they do, however, have to fall under the same budget. So if you're, again, doing social supports, the travel that you claim, it has to be under the social O4 budget as well. Um, this goes for uh, any supports that you've got transport being claimed in it, whether it's assistance with daily life, there are O1 transport codes, um, even with like capacity building, if you've got improved daily living, like therapies, there are like travel lines under 15 for therapy as well. Um, and one thing that a lot of and uh, people just uh, isn't really recognised because the NDIS don't mention it ever really, um, is like the la like the third set of digits on a supporting line item is like the registration code. That registration code also has to match with the service that you're providing. Um, so we are more than happy to educate and like advise you of that because again, this is one of the most common problems because people don't know that the transport has to be from the same budget. Um, so yeah, we can we can have a chat and work out which one's, you know, the correct one, the registration code, there are quite a few. Um, the only exception to that rule is support coordination. Um, but I will touch on that just shortly, but there is like one exception which the NDIS have made for us. Um, but yeah, sticking with non-labour and activity-based transport, the, one of the, we actually received a few questions around it was relating to like the rate that providers can charge per kilometre. So, the recommended rate that the NDIS has set is 85 cents per kilometre, whether like if you're located through like one to five. Um, however, they have sort of set the pricing arrangements at a benchmark of $1, which most providers abide by and invoice us for, which is fine. Um, a higher rate can be charged per kilometre, but it does need to be discussed and agreed upon with the participant. So this is, for example, if you're in remote or very remote areas. Um, if we do receive an invoice for travel services that it's over that $1 benchmark, we do query it just because it falls over that benchmark and it is essentially over the rate, um, which is then when we can ask for like any supporting documentations, um, you know, that agreement between yourself and the participant to state, oh, yep, we're, you know, allowed to charge over the rate because we've had that discussion and we're okay with that. Um, and then we'll just note that on file just in case it gets questioned again. You know, they'll see the note and be like, oh, yeah, that's fine. It's been discussed before. We've got it. Let's go. Um, I suppose like the, the flip side of charging more than the dollar is if um, the, the vehicle that's been, that is being used for the travel has been modified in any way, um, you know, for like accessibility. So for example, if it's got, if it's been modified to fit a wheelchair or a mobility scooter in it, the NDIS have set the rate at $2.40 per kilometre. Um, again, this isn't really recommended to go any further um, than that or any higher than that $2.40 um, because $2.40 is, again, quite expensive if you're travelling for, oh, I'm going to be really bad at maths now, if you're travelling for 100 kilometres and you're charging $2.40, what's that, $240? Like, that's a, that's a fair amount for your for the transport itself. Um, and, yeah, it, it doesn't um, necessarily matter, like, the make or the model of the car that just sort of decides the rate. It has to be abided by that $1 or, again, that $2.40 if it's an accessible vehicle. Um, with remote and very remote areas, um, when you're claiming per kilometre, that that rate can be discussed sort of with the participant, um, whether it's, you know, agreeing to charge slightly over that $1. Again, we would need it in documentation to support it, to say it's okay. Um, but we, we do just really want to keep in mind that sort of, a, you know, with remote and very remote areas, quite a large amount of kilometres can be travelled and even charging like $1 per kilometre, that is still a very large amount of money. For example, if, you've, if you're travelling for 300 kilometres, that's $300, you know, just specifically for the travel on top of the supports that's being provided as well. Um, but, you know, we, you guys can have those conversations. It's not up to us to say, look, oh God, that's too much. If you've got an, an arrangement, that's, you know, more than fine. You know, you've obviously had that discussion, which is all we can really ask for. Um, one note that I do just want to touch on in relation to sort of like 
charging for more than a dollar per kilometre is the NDA, they often don't build participants' plans with the transport or the travel included in the funding or like thought about in the funding. Um, you know, the plans they build, and like I'm not saying every plan, it's only, you know, it's very rarely a plan is written in with transport, but, you know, they will go through and find out how much support a participant requires um, and, you know, do the maths on that and work out in a bulk amount, this is how much it's going to cost to have these services, but very rarely do they include the amount of money that goes into the transport aspect of that participant's plan, uh, into that um, that service, sorry. So we do recommend making sure you have those discussions with your participants to note, you know, my my services are going to cost this much money and my transport is going to cost this much money. Um, you know, potentially let's work out a service agreement, have that discussion, um, and then we can actually see if that, if those services are going to fit in with that participant's plan, because if it doesn't, you know, we need to recommend a, 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 a an urgent plan review to see if we can get more funding into it because you now know how much the services are going to cost because travel is itself a service, you know, it's included within the services. Um, now I'll just touch on that support coordination that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the one exception to claiming transport that, that isn't under the same budget is support coordination because what the NDIS have allowed is they've allowed support coordination travel to be claimed under assistance with daily life because there is a code that's stated in the pricing arrangements for that. So if you had to look at the pricing arrangements and you had to look at your transport, uh, you look, look at your support coordination, sorry, um, it gives you a specific line item that you can use. Um, so it is, the un it is the only budget that you can claim a different budget for your transport because support coordination, as I'm sure some of you know, support coordination is sometimes stated as its own, like specifically just that support and a set amount of quantity for it. So the NDIS essentially gave like no wiggle room um, for you to, for to claim any of your travel. So um, yeah, they've, they've given us like a little, a little option to still claim for some transport. Um, so I'm hoping that that answered most or like at least some of the questions or like at least like more of an understanding of sort of like how transport, transport works. Thanks guys. Um, I know that was a lot. <laughs> <That> was <laughs> yes. These guys are our go-to for transport. So um, there are a few questions in the chat that I'll start reading out. Um, if anybody does have anything you want to take offline or organise a phone call after the session, just let me know. Um, Cause it, yeah, it can be quite complicated obviously. So Sanjay asked if the, is the provider allowed, allowed to charge more the recommended rate of $1, which I think we answered that following the question potentially. Um, oh, sorry, above that, Billy Jean, is it okay not to charge the client directly? Instead, I choose to claim through my tax. St uh, sorry, someone has jumped in. I'm losing her up to now. Um, an account, someone who's a practicing accountant has jumped in and said, yes, you can, but you won't be able to claim the whole amount back. Um, if you claim a dollar, it'll be tax deduction um, of 30%. So you will lose some of that. So I think that that answers that one. Um, Stacey, question. Wouldn't we rather the funding go to our actual services rather than the petrol? Um, yeah, essentially, like the way the NDIS set out, um, essentially what they've done is like the non-labour. So when you're claiming for the kilometres, that is sort of to go towards like the general running, the, like the running costs of the vehicle, which you know, petrol itself, we can't, like cannot be claimed through the NDIS, but that's why they've put in sort of this kind of like travel allowance essentially. So, you know, the road tolls, parking fees, and by definition, I think it is written as general run, like the running costs of the vehicle, aka the petrol, you know, registration, things like that. So, um, yeah, it would be preferred that the, the funding goes to the services itself and not like the petrol, but yeah, it's it just the way that the the, tr the transport's been like written out. Perfect. Um, Ellen um, has asked, we have therapists that attend communities and bill our travel costs, uh, flights, accommodation, car hire, et cetera, which we divide amongst our participants. We obviously get this approved with our participants prior. My question is, we used to build this like we build the non-labour travel costs as per hourly rate, but some plan managers get us to bill with the kilometre coding with the $1 rate. What is the correct way of billing this? 
Behaviour support practitioner is also the same as support coordinator sometimes at line item level. So is this the same as support coordinator travel? Alrighty, I'm, I'm just <laughs> rereading so I know I'm saying it right. So, so the, the non-labour travel costs that you've got in here, Ellen, that is the, um, the same coding for the kilometres. Did you mean the labour by time? Yeah, so like we will, I guess, essentially, like, yeah, attend communities and we have all those costings and then we will bill it at the hourly rate by time. We divide it amongst our participants and we, that's how we used to always do it. Um, but then, yeah, plan managers will come back and say, no, it needs to fall under the, yeah, the code, the dollar rate. Um, and then we do that by quantity. Okay. Um, that, 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 oh, so that's a little bit interesting. Um, so the NDIs actually do allow you to claim both by the, both the time travel and the kilometre travel because the kilometre travel is for like the, you know, ongoing sort of usage of the vehicle where the, the time is your service. Um, you should be able to claim either way. So if you're, if you're dividing it between participants and doing it by like that time, that would be fine. Um, yeah. Like if we received an invoice for that, I can't, I, I mean, I don't know. I no, can't see that rejecting at all. Like that would cost effective. Than it's probably yeah more cost effective than anything. Um, but if, yeah. if you're doing it by kilometer, that would also still go through because you're, yeah, you're, as long as you're billing it on the invoice correctly. Yeah. Yeah, essentially we do it at the hourly rate. You guys haven't been a problem. It's just other plan managers. Okay. Like they come back and they're just like, no, you have to do it by the $1 rate. And we're like, you know, you so much double handling. Like if there was it's just, just a notion way. cost that $1 is not a limit. It is just yeah. a, mm -hmm. that's what we need to submit claims at. So, yeah. you know, the 240 is more of a limit, I guess you could think mm. when it comes to the modified vehicle bits and bobs. But yeah, it's not a limit at all. No, yeah. so yeah. To, to answer it either way would be okay um i mean we can yeah like we can have a chat with you afterwards and like look at yeah. the invoices you're sending through and seeing what they might have flagged as wrong um yeah, okay. but yeah but yeah no, either, either way would have been perfectly fine in my eyes yeah cool thanks guys thanks guys and thanks ellen um Rufel has asked since line item 04 activity base gets drawn from core supports can we allocate a specific budget in the service agreement just like other support items, so we make sure we don't overspend. I think that's sort of been answered, but yeah, go for yeah, it. I can clarify that again. Yeah. So I think what you're asking is based on the supports that you're providing, if you're in your agreement stipulating. So, you know, for example, if you're providing in home personal, like daily activity support, but you're also doing social support, yes, we can allocate based on specific budgets, both in and out of core. Um, we don't allocate based on core, we allocate based on the four budgets, um, that sort of umbrella out of core. Um, does, I think that answers your question. I think that's what that you were asking. Yeah, Yeah. no worries. And let me know, um, oh, perfect. Yeah, all answered. Um, and then we've just got Sarah's last one. So Sarah asked, um, uh, in regards, to, I'm assuming this is the agency managed transport budget. The transport allowance is paid to the participant fortnightly. Will that show up on their profile? Uh, NAPA. By profile, you mean like the NAPA portal? Um, it would only show the, the um, plan managed budgets. Um, it would be written into the participants like official plan document. Um, but if it's if it is a, an allowance that's paid to the participant fortnightly, you would just need to have a chat with the participant. Um, because yeah, it is managed by the agency. And we, unfortunately, like the initial plan document, like the original sort of like paper copy, we can see sort of like the agency and self-managed budgets that are in there, but we can only see the total that they were given. We can't see like how it's been spent or anything like that. And yeah, we can, yeah, unfortunately only see the plan managed side of it, so. Just one point on that, in regards to those fortnightly payments, there should be a record on their MyGov access. So that's one thing that you can also look into. But as Mark said, if it's agency managed the fortnightly payments, we have no records or access to any of that. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, um, okay. Yeah, and yeah, just one thing actually Carol just mentioned as well. Um, NDSP, we actually don't always get a copy of participants' plans. Like we'll sometimes get like the um like the RFS document or anything like that. But yeah, unfortunately, we often are asking participants, like, hey, I know we've had your plan with NDSP for maybe like six months, but we actually don't have a copy of the plan. 
you know, are you able to provide us that or like provide us the step of like the information we're looking for? So yeah, same with you guys, unfortunately, like if you guys don't have a copy of it, like sometimes we don't as well. Perfect. Um, Sarah's still waiting for the letter copy of the NDIS plan. It's been two months. Um, yeah, right. we know that we know that the support coordinators don't always get a copy as well, which makes it really difficult for us to have those conversations and work out how we can spend the funding. Uh, yeah. Sometimes without seeing some of that um, broken down, yeah, it's really tricky. Yeah, and like we like we encourage obviously the plans to come through because we don't want to make we don't want to make any assumptions or like you know oh, this is you know commonly how this budget is sort of set out we we want to make sure that we're not you know saying oh yeah this you know service or this item is fine to go through and then get a copy of the plan a few months later and go oh we definitely shouldn't have done that like that funding is specific for something else so you know we're, <laughs> we 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 know it can be really difficult like but we're, we we try our hardest not to be difficult we're just like yeah trying to <laughs> trying to make it make sure it's all okay and yeah. you know one little point I just want to touch on in regards to the copies of the plans, which just might be helpful information. Participants can get a copy through their MyGov portal. And if they don't have access to that, they can actually contact the NDI just by a phone and request for it to be emailed to anybody. Um, as long as it's the participant involved in that call, they can request for that to happen. So that's just an easy way to get it really quickly instead of waiting for the actual paper copy to be mailed. Yeah, if that helps. Yeah, this sounds like you're not alone yeah. with <laughs> so frustration okay. around that, unfortunately. <laughs> Perfect. That's some great tips. Thanks, guys. Um, and I reckon we'll just jump straight on into the next topic. There's no extra questions there, so we'll just get moving. Um, and then at the end, you can ask anything you like. So this next one is um, a bunch of random questions, I suppose, that we were asked by you guys. So they're not one topic in general. So yeah, you guys can just go straight through these. Um, basically, plan manager constraints, a little bit of assistive technology, and just some other common queries. So go for it. Yeah, so one interesting question we got was any information around a participant wanting to switch from an agency managed either budget or entire plan to plan managed and the simple answer for this is participants have rights to dispute any decision that the NDIA make. Uh, and if going agency managed is and being in rural areas, it can present a lot of complications in regards to accessing, um, you know, non or, you know, registered providers, they can request for that change. Um, it would be contacting the NDIA and having that discussion. If a decision is made that it is to be agency managed, there should be a reason behind that. And you can go from there. So my recommendation is to just contact the NDIA and discuss that from there. The next question we got through was what are the actual limits of plan managers when it comes to making decisions, processing invoices and whether a service falls in or out of sort of the funding for individual participants or just the scope of the NDIS uh, in general. So key points are plan managers do have a few responsibilities. Uh, you know, this includes making sure that the claims that we're submitting are accurate to the invoices that we get. And this is what can cause a lot of issues. If a line item on an invoice is incorrect, we need to send that back and provide advice on how to amend that invoice. We can't process an invoice with an incorrect line item and we can't change it ourselves. Um, we have to make sure that we are recognising overspends, underspends, and we also have a responsibility to ensure that funds are being utilised appropriately. So they're not what we call being involved in a misuse of funds. So. You know, there are grey areas, as I'm sure you will understand when it comes to what the NDIA do and don't fund. We have great knowledge around what is funded and we can very easily match that to participants' plans, but there is a lot of bits and bobs that can be up for interpretation, which can differ from plan manager to plan manager. So we have a full team that is dedicated to essentially helping participants and their support networks make these sort of decisions and we can provide this advice and this guidance but another key point is that plan managers are not actually allowed to make what the NDA would call a reasonable and necessary decision we can't say what is and isn't funded if it's in one of those gray areas so we can only guide and provide advice um, and if it's something that's unlikely to be funded, we then provide further advice on how we can get clarification, which is usually contacting the NDIA because they are the ones that make these decisions. 
because if we don't, there are consequences if supports are paid outside of what the plan does allow. Um, and, you know, that could be a matter of, of you know, debt paying the NDI back, which they can request. They do hold that right to request those funds back um, from plan managers or participants. Okay. So another question we had come through, sorry, was, it was really interesting. It's whether funds and capacity building are, are flexible. So we all know, you've probably heard it a hundred times, cause flexible. So I guess it comes down to what you define as flexible. So if we're talking moving funds between budgets, it's a no, unfortunately not. We cannot move funds between separate capacity building budgets like we can uh, in core. But on the other end, some supports that are funded through capacity building budgets can be funded through a couple of different ones. Like one example is exercise physiology that is funded through one capacity building budget, improved daily living skills, but it's also funded in the exact same way through another budget called improved health and wellbeing. They're both capacity building, but you can't move funds between them. Um, but you can generally, it would be client specific, but you can technically make a claim through both budgets. So it is flexible in that sense, where there's a sometimes there's a bit of flexibility with different budgets funding the same supports, but you cannot move funds between them, nor can you move funds from capacity building into core or vice versa. Um, moving on to the next question, which was really interesting, is complex home modifications and can they be assessed or can plan reviews happen like on an ad hoc basis? So when it comes to complex home modifications, uh, a good point to take away is that the bottom line is if a complex home modification is to be provided and paid for by the NDIA, the funding needs to be in the plan to pay for it. So that would then mean that an assessment would have been completed, you know, uh, recommendations would have been submitted, a quote would have been approved and it would have been all done through the NDIA. And then, you know, we as a plan manager would then be able to make payments basically through that. So short answer is if funding is not available in the plan for a complex home modification, a plan review needs to take place. If that has become a sudden need of the participant, it might be an access requirement, that would be grounds for a change of circumstances, which you could use uh, to essentially get that assessment submitted and assessed by the NDI with the hope that it is approved at the end of that. Okay, um, and then I think we'll just move on to our last question, which is around the $15,000, you know, change when it comes to mid-cost AT, um, lots of lines, you know, removing that need for a quote, um, you know, and does it replace some bits and bobs? And we have a specific example that I'll go through in a moment. So the NDIA around early March redefined what is considered mid-cost. It's no longer up to 5,000. It's between 1,500 and 15,000 now. Um, they basically did that so that they had justification to remove a bunch of lines um, that were quote required. So they're no longer quote required. This just means things are gonna get funded a little bit quicker. The NDI don't need to approve a quote anymore. But again, like I explained when it was with the home modifications funding for complex, high risk, mid cost assist, assistive technology, the funding still needs to be in the plan for us to be able to make a payment. That's just sort of the bottom line. So that could be in a couple of different ways. That's gonna be a little bit too great. It's gonna be client specific. So if you have any questions, you can always give us a call to discuss. But basically, again, the funding needs to be in the plan for us to be able to make a payment. So an example we had was, there are numerous amputees in the Northern Territory that do not have funding for prosthetics in the plan. So I would think if we're talking for an actual prosthetic, not just small bits and bobs funding, and that's a necessary requirement, the NDIA do need to recognise that. And just the appropriate assessments and recommendations would need to be made on an ad hoc basis to the NDI as a change of circumstances to get funding implemented for a prosthetic if that's necessary. Um, it for that particular participant. But um, yeah, so that's basically what those changes were, okay? And that is all of the additional questions. So if anybody has any questions, um, comments, uh, even additional topics, if it's a quick, easy question, um, but even suggestions for future sessions like this, feel free to pop them in the chat or send them through to me. Um, yeah, thanks so much, guys. You've done a great job today. There's <laughs> a lot of information. 
Um, so we will send it out um, to everybody with the slides and the recording as well. So if there's anything you want to listen back on, um, if you'd like more information on travel and transport, which we know is really difficult, get in contact with us. Um, we'd be more than happy to have a phone call. Um, I'll just run through quickly. Oh, hang on, there has been something. Um, has anyone utilised an external source to support an unscheduled plan review submission? Uh, having varies OT or psychosocial reports, recommendations, et cetera, needs to be written in the submission. So external source could be lots of things like Mark mentioned before, I've heard people accessing their local member of parliament, you know, to, to request those schedule or maybe overrule a decision made by the, or not overrule, but dispute a decision mm -hmm. made by the NDIA. Um, you know, when it comes to AT, our experience, you know, because obviously we're not involved in that process, but our experience sort of just says having those assessments, recommendations, you know, from people that would be relevant to the particular needs. So if it's something like a prosthetic, you know, there might be a particular specialist that might be involved, even something like an occupational therapist might be involved. Assessments from those allied health supports are always going to be really beneficial. The NDI love their allied health professionals. Um, and listen to their recommendations and have everything, everything together, like quotes and bits and bobs and taking them to those assessments is always going to be beneficial. Yeah. Um, it, it, one thing to also mention, um, it doesn't necessarily need to be like a full report as well. Um, this comes up a little bit when we, rec when, you know, we need like a supporting documentation. Some people sort of automatically go to like a letter of recommendation, which can actually be quite expensive for participants to go and obtain for something. Um, it, when we sort of go for documentation, especially with like unscheduled plan reviews, sometimes it can just be an email or a letter from sort of an external source to support it. It doesn't need to be something that's super, oh, I guess, I guess saying like super professional seeming to have like a full report or anything. It can just be, you know, this, this information supports this decision, you know, and information like that. Um, oftentimes with unscheduled plan reviews sometimes it's the providers that can actually give us the most amount of information to support a plan review or support a change of circumstance because the provider is the one with the participant like they're the ones that see them and you know see that they may need more assistance or more funding um so it doesn't always need to be super professional like a like a full report um which i think not a lot of people know but it's really good to to know You're still on mute, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> That's two. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, we'll pop through. There's a few different resources that we'll send out after this. Um, we do have one on travel and transport, which is quite handy. Um, it's a really simple overview uh, for providers. So we'll send that out um, as well as some other documents that we have that are handy for people starting in support coordination roles or even participants that are new to the scheme. Um, so we'll send them out. And another thing I wanted to mention for any new providers online is we do have a provider directory through our website that we run. Um, it's completely free for providers and participants to use. Um, and we did create this, um, just as we heard, there was a, a huge disconnect and participants up here were really struggling to find providers. So um, it's free for you to register and advertise your business. Um, and we do send it out to our clients regularly and it's a free way for them to find local services. So. I'll send out a link to that, which you're more than welcome um, to register on. Um, and yeah, that's it from us. I hope everybody got something out of today. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, yeah, we'll send out our contact details um, after this. If there's anything else, I will stay online for another few minutes. So if anybody has anything, um, feel free to take yourself off mute, happy to chat um, or pop yeah. something in the chat box. <laughs> we'll have to get a purple folder especially just for you Sarah <laughs> <laughs> yes I would appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> have a good day guys you too thank, thank you, you. Thank okay, you. Bye. see ya